you guys see, uh, you guys are able to see my um, the full slide and my picture. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much all for taking time to join. Uh, and thank you, Chike, for giving me an opportunity to present, um, talk about multifamily tonight. I know some of the folks in this group are you know, experienced syndicator or experienced active investors, but they may not be, there may be some folks who are a little less experienced. So this presentation is geared towards taking care of uh, both the scenarios. We have, a, we have a lot of material to cover today. Um, and, you know, so we will try to cover as much as we can. We have about 20 slides, uh, two and a half minutes each slide. Um, so that's about 45, 50 minutes worth of material. So let's get started. Once again, my name is Prashant Kumar. Um, you know, I'm the president of Multifamily Realty Gains. And, uh, you know, I live here in Long Island, but uh, in year 2019, we were doing very good. Uh, we were, we had done deals in about 1200 units um, in 2019 alone. But this year so far, we are a little bit, you know, like everybody else, we are a little bit behind. So having said that, um, you know, the disclaimer, basically this material is only for entertainment purposes. Any recommendations being made here is only for only to be taken uh, on the face value. Everybody assumes the risk. Uh, they need to consult their professional uh, service providers uh, for any decisions that they take. Um, again, my name is Prashant Kumar. I talked about you know myself a little bit. I've been in the industry for almost 25 years. But in real estate, I started my career about five years ago. And because of my technology background, um, you know, I'm able to do a lot of things in real estate, you know, a lot of technical stuff, analyzing the deals. Um, you know, I own I do I have done G, JVs, I have done GPs. Um, you know, I own my own portfolio of 100 units, about 100 units. So, yeah, so basically, you know, for, for, for real estate, um, what is that? What is the initial step, right? Initial step for real estate is finding the properties, right? I mean, for finding the properties, what do we do? The most important thing is your relationship with the brokers, right? You start calling brokers. Uh, in the cities which you have selected for yourself. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them. But then the cities that you have selected, um, you know, we have to form our, our team, you know, our team of property managers, team of GCs. If you know somebody local in that area, boots on the ground, we, we need to have, we need to start building that because that's a, ver that's a key component. The two components, so, I mean, syndication business, you know, you have to have the relationship with the brokers and you have to have the relationship with your investors, right? And basically it's a constant effort that you keep analyzing the properties, you know, you keep submitting LOIs. And once, once we have a deal, you know, you basically uh, start, uh, st you structure the deal correctly. And then for the step after that is loan qualification. Um, you know, and, and if you guys have any questions, please, please feel free to type in the window. But, uh, you know, I have asked GK to look at, uh, you know, look at the uh, chat window. And if there are any questions, we will, we will answer them. Um, so where, where, where do you find brokers? I mean, anybody, I think the best place to find brokers is LoopNet, right? I mean, I go to, bro I go to LoopNet only to find brokers, not for the property. You know, you, you, you would go to the loop net and, you know, you will, you will find um, basically brokers and you will find the properties listed by small brokers. The reason we look for properties listed by small brokers is if you see the property listed by a big broker, chances are you're going to pay, pay the premium. 
So you go to you you go for a small broker, go to the broker's website and try to connect with the principal bro broker, not not his uh, you know uh, not the not with the folks who are under him. Uh, typically, small brokers have a team of four or five people. They they are semi experienced people. So your job is to start connect with the principal of of any small brokerage. And once you have uh, connected, once you have found the broker list, you know broker, you go and subscribe to their listing through their websites. You know, I mean, I typically like to say that you know try to call one new broker every day. Right. I mean, just just follow one rule. If I if I call one broker a day, one new broker a day, how many brokers would I have? How many new brokers would I have called in a month? Twenty. I mean, if you are talking about city like Atlanta or city like Indianapolis, or I mean, for that matter, any city, Orlando, you know, uh, Boston, or whatever is your area where you want to buy property if you are if you have 20 brokers in your in your list and you are constantly having the contact with them you know you are going to find a property pretty soon i mean that's that's typically there's no magic bullet to it but you have to follow your steps you have to be persistent um, you have to be persistent without that um, without that you know we can we can end up spending a lot of time and not uh, not able to achieve the results, right? So fundamentally, you know, you continue to find brokers and start calling them. That's that's the real key. I mean, that's how I would tell my story, how I found people. I mean, how I found properties, uh, which we'll talk. All right. So be confident when you when we when we when we talk to these brokers. The other thing is you have to set a budget aside. If you are a new syndicator uh, or if you are, or forget about syndication, even if you want to buy property for yourself, right? And you don't want, I mean, broker is one thing. Yes, you are gonna buy property through broker. But in addition to that, I mean, there might be off market properties that, that one can buy, right? And for that, what needs to be done? Some some marketing needs to be done. Uh, you need to set some budget aside. You know, sub, you have to subscribe to some data source. Um, and uh, basically, you find the data for the area that you are interested in, right? Um, and your goal is to find properties. Maybe you look for free and clear properties. You know, contact the mailing companies, uh, and uh, um, basically. Uh, basically send direct mailers. I mean, in my personal experience, the first apartment complex which I bought, I bought like that, you know, I have done marketing. Uh, I used, I, I posted a small bright postcard. I never send uh, the envelope, um, a letter in an envelope because nobody opens the envelope, right? Nobody has the um, time to open an envelope. So whatever information I want to print, I print, on a piece of yellow, bright yellow postcard, you know, fluorescent postcard. And and that postcard goes, invariably everybody looks at it, right? I mean, it takes five seconds. And during that time, if if they have, um, you know, if the postcard has, uh, I mean, if they have read it, sometimes they call, right? So one is, one is your postcard. Second is, um, you know, hire somebody to make calls. If you have time, you make calls basically. So your goal is to connect with these mom and pop owners. I'm not talking about bigger properties here. I'm talking about only uh, small mom and pop owners uh, so that, uh, you know, we can buy, uh, you know, we, uh, we can buy smaller pro properties. I mean, when I say smaller properties, it could be as much as, you know, 50, up to 50, 60 units, right? So, um, this can be done easily and not not much of budget is required for that you know you you probably would need maybe five six hundred or maybe thousand dollar worth of budget uh, per month and try that out for a couple of months invariably these are the techniques they always work you know i mean if you want to go more sophisticated you know then you are talking about facebook ads google ads and messenger ads and there you end up 
uh, spending a little bit of money. Again, it all depends on the budget. Uh, but I mean, in past, these direct mailers and hiring the calling services companies, uh, they work all the time. I mean, they always work. I mean, right now we are in a situation where a lot of sellers are kind of sitting tight. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are making, if you are making calls, it's a good time to connect with them. Maybe they are not ready to sell or maybe they are not, we are not ready to buy, but it's, it's the time when we can connect with these sellers, you know. Um, so, and the fundamental thing is to follow, follow with your leads regularly. That's, that's the real key. So have you syndicated those 40 and 50 unit apartments or are you not? No, so it, it's really up to you, uh, up to your cash flow, whether, um, I mean, it, it's up to how much you, what kind of deal do you want to do? I mean, are you going to do a JV here or you are going to, if you have the money for down payment, I mean, is this something that you would like to buy? There are, multi, there are a couple of things that you can do, okay? One is you can buy it for yourself or you can have the JV partners or you can do the syndication. For, I mean, as we have discussed many times, doing the syndication for a smaller property doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't, I mean, that's really what I was asking. So you, you and Ed are not syndicating 40 and 50 unit buildings. Or 50, 40 and 50 units, and the cost of doing the syndication itself is so high. You know, you're talking about $20,000, $30,000 just to do the paperwork for syndication, okay. and it's not worth I mean, if it is more than, you know, if you are buying a property worth 5 million, I mean, it depends, you know, if you're buying 40 units somewhere in New Jersey, that might be, uh, you know, seven, 8 million, uh, that you can do the syndication. It's not about the number of units, it's the price of the property, okay. right? If it is less than 5 million, maybe it is not worth doing the syndication. Got it. Got it. Right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, how do you find your proper uh, cities? I mean, there are a couple of rules of rules of thumb that I have implemented myself uh, for my search for cities when I was small. Uh, now things have changed. I mean, small in the sense is when I was starting. Um, now I'm doing the syndication. So uh, I look for different criteria, but uh, typically I would look for properties which have grown uh, anywhere from 10 to 20%. Uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, uh, you know, typical rule is if the prop, if the population of, of MSA is uh, greater than 1 million, I would look for at least 10 percent growth. And, and that's how we get the, you know, property. You can type it in Google and Google can give you the growth in the population of a city very easily. You know, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent that works best. And if you look for the medium income growth, um, there are various websites. You know, City Data is is a, is a good site. Um, if the medium income growth is at least 30 percent. Medium household prices have grown at least 40 percent, and it's not in one year, right? It's ever since 2000. The City Data gives the data from uh, 2000 to 2000. Now I think it is going up to 2017. Um, so that's how you would look at, you know, population growth, medium income growth, medium household prices, right? The crime rate is an important factor. You know, it has to be below 500 in city data. You know, the, your job growth, um, you know, should be should be good. Um, I think job growth is I forgot more than five percent or something. I'll have to look into that. What was the real number? But the job growth you can find from Department of Numbers, and then you have the state should be landlord friendly state. You, go to, you can go to landlordstations.com and price to rent ratio um, that you can get from smartassets.com anywhere from 15 to 23%, right? So uh, these are some, some rule of thumbs for us to pick uh, the cities where we want to invest in. I mean, are we, are we, are we investing in uh, you know bigger MSAs like Atlanta or Orlando or uh, you know some of these big cities um, like Cincinnati or uh, you, know, uh, you know in Colorado you know Denver 
it, it all depends, you know, what, what is that you are, are you looking to invest in primary market, secondary market or tertiary markets? That's a, that's a whole separate discussion that we can have. But even if you are going into secondary and tertiary markets, uh, I would definitely look for, for certain attributes. Uh, without that, I would not select any data, any city. As a general rule of thumb, I do not look for a city where I don't find a circle of uh, highway, you know. I don't find, I don't invest in a city where I have only plus sign for the highways, one going east to west and one going uh, north uh, to south. I don't invest uh, in those places. At least it is as big that it has some some, uh, you know, it, it has a uh, circular, you know, ring road around around the city. So that's typically my my rule of thumb, uh, which I have not seen anybody talking about. But until I see that, I don't invest in in that area. bunch of bunch of other resources, you know, as I said, smartassets.com, you know, you know, price to rent ratio. You can find landlord friendly state in landlord station. Then uh, Zillow gives you the trend, you know, basically uh, home values, department of numbers gives, gives you job growth. So all, all, the, all of these websites have their own ranking. So whenever you are looking for, uh, um, for cities where you want to invest in, you should always just, it takes five minutes to look at all of them at once, right? I mean, Tulia, Zillow, Yardi Matrix, Realtor, for, dot com Forbes apartment list. So I mean it takes about five, ten minutes for one to just go through all these resources which are freely available for us uh, on the internet. Uh, fundamental thing is if, if you are seeing the rent growth, it means it is cash flow. Uh, and if you are looking for you know price growth uh, in, in any area, it means it is good for appreciation. We're not talking about COVID and impact of COVID. One one more thing those who stick around till the end of presentation, there is a free gift link, which I will send. I wrote an ebook on impact of uh, the session on impact of COVID on real estate in the United States. So I'm gonna share that link towards the middle or towards the end of this presentation. Um, you know, as I said, you know, there's some paid contents also, housingalerts.com, local market monitor, dot uh, com yardi metrics and it doesn't cost too much you know if you are active actively looking for um, deals it's better that one should subscribe to these for a couple of months at least and uh, when you when you are um, you know done looking into the, if you have done enough research in that market or neighborhoods then you can unsubscribe them I'm talking from the perspective of newcomers, sort of new active investors, as well as those who are very active, you know, larger syndicators, they don't care about, you know, how much does it cost because these deals are worth, uh, yes, the, I mean, these deals are worth uh, multi-million, these for $1,500 it don't matter. Uh, yes, these presentations will be sent out. Uh, when you look at the Zillow, you, Basically, you are looking for the trend, right? I mean, you are looking at the trend in the area. How are the house prices? How are the income? So if the house prices are stagnant, so to say, there are certain markets, certain tertiary markets where house prices have not gone, or as a matter of fact, they have gone down. So you don't want to look at them, those areas. So basic idea is to feel whether this area has been growing or not. Right. I mean, if you talk about Birmingham and Alabama, right? I mean, I haven't seen the prices going up in that area. So, and the population is decreasing. Um, I mean, there are de deals that have come across our table, but we have not uh, paid attention to them, primarily because, um, primarily because, um, you know, those are those are the non-growing, not, there hasn't been much growth over the last 20 years. I mean, what are the chances that those, those areas will grow further? So yeah, basically if you, yes. I mean, somebody asked me, 
are we looking for 20% population growth in a city of 1 million or, or more? No, for a, for, a, for a city where the population is more than a million, we are looking for 10% growth over last 15 years. If it is less than a million, then general rule of thumb is approximately 20%. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm moving a little faster because of the time. Um, um, so for somebody, uh, you know, they say, what is a high cap rate? Is a high cap rate better or a lower cap rate? Um, and the answer is, the answer is, it depends. You know, if you are, uh, and again, it is about somebody who wants to buy an asset for themselves, uh, typically, syndicators would not would not look at 14 cap property at all. I mean, 14 cap or 11 cap properties. But if you are looking to buy a small portfolio of row houses or 25, uh, you know, unit property or something, and somebody says, "I'm giving you a, this property package," and the cap rate is 24, 24. Um, yes, it is 24. But are you gonna are you going to like that? I mean, the chances are it's a D-class asset, um, and um, you know whatever money you are going to put in, uh, that is that will all be lost. So do not worry about such properties. Uh, it is just uh, just an example. If the market is eight cap market or six cap market, and somebody is giving you an asset at ten cap, I mean fifteen cap or eighteen caps or some ridiculous number. It's, it's best that you run away, you know, from, from that, right? I mean, there's nothing, nobody's going to give you anything for free. Chances are you probably will not even get your rent back, monthly rent from those deals. So, uh, you know, typically syndicators don't look at, uh, you know, that those higher cap rates at all. I mean, because any fluctuation of cap rate, uh, even half, you know, 50 basis point, uh, is good enough, you know, from entry to exit, uh, if it is a value add deal, uh, you're talking 14 cap, we would not even worry about them. So yeah, basically Coistar and Exio Matrix will give you, you know, market market and some market reports. When you are talking to these brokers, a lot of information you can achieve, you can find, you can get from the brokers, right? So you don't, you don't have to sign up for Coistar or, Yardi metrics or axiometrics, you know, once you start talking to the broker and you have built a relationships, broker will provide you all that information um, because these are expensive uh, subscriptions. Uh, I don't know the exact price, but um, you know, anywhere from 10 to $20,000. And if you are the beginner or sort of an intermediate investor, you really don't need to have uh, these, uh, subscribed basically for individual usage. All right, so I talk a little bit about how to find, find the cities and what to do basically. Once you have established your city list um, and then you do a little bit of marketing and you start calling brokers and submitting LOIs. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the syndication steps that we do if you have found a property, you know, maybe 5 million plus, that's, uh, I think that's a fair number, five or 8 million plus if you want to do syndication. So basically um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, I mean, everything starts from what is, what is your objective? You know, are you an active investor or passive investor, right? Um, all right, somebody is asking a question, um, you know, can you spend a minute on what the benefit of lower cap market may be for the attendees that are less familiar with the cap rate? So, so basically, what is a cap rate, right? Cap rate is, is a characteristic that defines the growth, growth in the, in the market, right? If it is a competitive market, you are looking for lower cap rate properties. It means the property prices are higher or elevated, right? So, so I mean, 
about a year ago or two years ago, the cap rates were a little bit on the higher side and we are from eight to nine. But as the market kept on increasing, the cap rates started falling down. I mean, they, they have been falling down for the last so many years. But just let's take an example of Atlanta, right? If you are buying a property in Atlanta, uh, the cap rate, you know, we are talking about cap rate anywhere from 5.5 to 6.5, depending upon which neighborhood you are buying, anywhere from 5 to 6.5, something like that, right? It means that it, it, this is a market which, which has grown which has seen significant growth over a period of time and there is demand, right? I mean, there was time when brokers, I mean, now broker is not even publishing the, publishing the uh, whisper price. I mean, they are just saying, you know, expected prices depending upon market. So there's a bidding war. There was a bidding war going on to get into the property. So the lower cap rate markets are the ones where the prices have gone up considerably and it has become very difficult for, for beginners or syndicators to get into those deals and still justify uh, you know, higher returns for their investors. In a high cap market can be your D, D class neighborhood, D minus class here neighborhood where you have you know, 50 unit uh, building but nobody pays the rent. I mean, you are you are almost you are you are almost calculating cap rate on pro forma only. In reality, you, you never get your uh, rent back from those uh, tenants. So you are saying that yes, I have fifty units, you know, thousand dollar per unit. You, you know, you, you are talking about fifty thousand dollar worth of cash flow coming every month, and somebody will say, oh, my expense ratio is only. Why? Not true. I mean, that, does, that doesn't happen. So lower cap rate means you know more stabilized assets, you, and the market has seen enough growth, and there is is, is much more competition to get into those uh, assets, whether it is individual purchase or JV or syndication. So uh, any more questions? Feel free to ask me. But on syndication steps, uh, in, as I said, you know. If we are new, uh, typically we say that it's better that we invest with somebody. I mean, if we are, let's say I'm a doctor, right? Or I'm a you know, lawyer or attorney. I don't want to buy anything for myself. Maybe I will be a passive investor. Uh, and it is easy for passive investor. There are a bunch of people, the bunch of deals out there. They can vet the syndicator out and then they can invest with them. But we are not talking about um, passive investors today. So we will, we are just talking about active investors, those who want to buy property for themselves, manage themselves, I mean, manage themselves means have the property manager and manage those assets or do JV or, or do syndication. So let's keep moving. Uh, so basically, as I said, you know, we talked about you gather all the data about the location, uh, the price range that you want to buy the property in, and the important thing is now you have to identify a role that you want to play uh, in a deal, right? I mean, we have talked many, many times in many, many calls is if you are a newbie uh, or, you know, you are, you are not complete full-fledged sponsor of a deal and you are looking to buy something or you want to do some active investment, maybe, maybe it is better that you, you narrow down the area that you can focus on um, you know, become the equity partner on a deal or, you know, bring the deal to the table or br bring the whole deal to the closure, get the contract signed. So all the, the bunch of things that you can do in a deal. So you identify a role uh, basically for yourself, gather all that information, have that information at one place. Um, you know, uh, as I said, you know, we already talked to many brokers. You are introducing yourself um, basically and the important thing is now you are already starting to talk to the local banks or um, you know credit unions or the finance brokers uh, also uh, at the same time. If I'm looking for property, let's say in Indianapolis, right? I probably would like to number one survey that area, but two, I would like to talk to local banks or credit unions depending upon what kind of property I'm I'm buying. If I'm buying it for myself, I would just go to the local banks 
which typically don't give the uh, loan so easily uh, to the out of state owners, but in some cases maybe they, they can too uh, if you get go through a referral. So most important thing again, uh, as I said, you know, talking to the brokers and submitting LOIs. Okay, I typically believe in uh, a framework: uh, three hours a day for three months. You know, three hours a day for three months, and talking to one new broker a day. I mean, most likely you'll have anywhere from twenty to forty brokers in an area. And if you are spending three, four hours, if you are spending three, four hours a day uh, and you are submitting LOIs, then I mean, two, three LOIs a week, chances are that you will end up ha having a deal in three to four months. Again, uh, we are not talking about COVID or anything for how long we need to wait and all that. That's a separate discussion and, uh, and we can talk about that. But uh, right now we are just assuming that the market is, is good enough and, and just general guidelines, you know. So, so in, in so you are looking for local banks, credit unions. You are looking, we are talking to your, you know, general contractors. You know, you know, PM companies. Uh, once you have the property, you know, you have, you are analyzing. The important thing is, if you are talking to new brokers, and a broker has sent you the property, the important thing for you is to analyze that deal as soon as possible. Don't sit on it and send your underwriting file back to the broker and ask for his opinion. Now you have gotten broker's attention that you are serious. Typically, brokers have tough time trusting uh, new, you know, new contacts until they see the seriousness. Um, you know, and, and if you show, I mean, that's just an example. You know, if you have broker sends you a property and you respond back right away in a day, then it, broker knows that you know you are you are serious uh, or somewhat serious and you are asking for opinion you, you can review the your underwriting with the broker uh, you know to build that contact with him so as i said you know every time you are talking to your folks you know you, you keep making notes um, you know and uh, uh, basically date and time wise that way you know time will come that you will start forgetting things you know you, your crm has to be good enough uh, where you are making these notes or um, you know whichever way you are making notes you know excel spreadsheet crm or you know paper notebooks are no good anymore i mean even though i i do spend time on paper notebooks but the challenge is how to find the uh, information uh, in future um, i don't like paper notebook anymore so yeah some some basic stuff you know you're talking to the pm companies in that area broker banks local uh, you know uh, local property managers um, and if, if possible you talk to the tenant also when you do the walkthrough or um, you talk to the tenants in the community yeah, basically but i mean that will happen actually this is not this is the wrong step it will happen after the loi and maybe after during the due diligence but once the LOI is acknowledged, then you are asking for, by that time you should, if before LOI you did not have offering memorandum T12 or rent roll, the moment LOI is accepted, you should ask for that information because that is the information that you will need to do the underwriting for your deal. So analyze the numbers, basically then you are visiting your property along with your property manager, construction companies, these are, very important steps uh, going a little bit faster um, you so important so good thing is that when you are looking at a property you have to you have to analyze the appearance you know how is the quality of neighborhood are is this something uh, that you are comfortable um, you know getting into because if it is a c minus kind of area um, and your property is 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 all almost C class property, then improving that property to B class will not give you the bank for your box. So it's not just the property, it's the area, neighborhood, that is that is needed to be looked at, right? So some, some, some basic stuff here, I'm not gonna talk too much about these. Um, in general, we look at the roofing, you know, parking, curb appeal, you know, utilities, 
what kind of utilities we have, you know, water, gas, electricity, you know, check the entrance, you know, go around, drive around the property, you know, and then ask for comparables about for the property. What are the comps in that area? Uh, because that is going, that is important piece of information, uh, whether you find it yourself from um, paid data sources or you ask your broker to give the comps because you want to compare what is the rent per square feet uh, for, um, for the other comparable properties today or when, uh, when you would at the time of exit, would, would they, are they comparable or not? So drive around the neighborhood, um, basically, and again, research, 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 you know, how much, how much can you research about, about your deal? It all depends, you know, how big of a property it is, but, um, you know, you have to do your rigorous underwriting uh, without that, um, you know, you know, that, that your rigorous underwriting, you know, basically, and then you review your underwriting with the broker. So, yeah, you review your underwriting the broker and then you do the counter and then, then you discuss with the owners basically. So, um, um, and in the end, basically you secure a contract. Once you have discussed the deal um, with the seller or with the broker, um, then you go into the, uh, into the contract. Once you have got in, into the contract, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of, lot of steps, you know, that's when the real work starts. Uh, all the due diligence, you know, engaging the property manager who will do the due diligence, you know, then you are talking to the financing options, you know, you are talking to the finance broker, you know, local banks or the credit unions, and you are negotiating with them also. You are not just negotiating with, you are actually negotiating with a lot of people at that time. You are negotiating with your finance broker, local banks, credit unions, you are negotiating with uh, you know, your broker, uh, you're negotiating with, with the seller also because there, I mean, still things going on. I mean, towards the end of the period, you know, when you want an extension, things like that, there uh, some discussions go on with the seller. Uh, but that's a, that's a lengthy process. I mean, this is just a lengthy process. I mean, we, we can discuss about it. It, it, it is, it, I mean, depending on the kind of deal you are. If it is an opportunistic deal, chances are this is going to be a long-term um, uh, effort before you close it, right? It, de it depends, you know, what is your backing. Um, so we can discuss all that, but uh, again, it comes with the with, uh, experience. And if you are getting into some, some deal like that, and if you are a newbie, I mean, and not to discourage anybody, but learn to walk before you start start thinking of running uh, either you you know have a coach or a mentor or or give the deal to somebody and play a smaller role in the deal so so that that's something just uh, a word of caution from me So um, from LOI to a contract somebody is asking uh, how long can it take before you get to contract? So, I mean, if you are submitting LOIs, uh, from LOI to contract can be, can be a, you know, if a two weeks time period, I mean, you can, it, it all depends how fast you, you do your work, um, you know, you do your underwriting clearly, you talk to, the, you know, you, you look at the property, uh, do all these things. Uh, what we just talked about, it can be as little as a week. In some cases, you know, it could be much lesser if you already knew the asset. Uh, but I would say as a precaution, one week to two weeks is, is normal. Can it be more? It can be more also, but uh, again, it, it, it depends. But I would say two weeks maybe is a reasonable amount of time from LOI to contract. And if you are in a bridge situation, you know, uh, you, you are talking about uh, construction budget, right? I mean, broker will ask for the construction budget and that would need a lot of work. You know, you need to have the GC and PM involved because all that needs to be underwritten, right? And, and you need to get the uh, construction 
quotes from GC or from uh, from um, you know from the property manager if property manager is playing the part of the construction manager so all that needs to be decided so it, it's and if you are in a bit situation two weeks is not going to be sufficient most likely but again it depends on the deal if it is more opportunistic deal then uh, that duration could be more if it is more of a stable asset uh, or a light value add then maybe two weeks should would be sufficient so continue to refine your budget uh, because you know you are talking to the bridge lenders right and they they will continue to refine they will continue to review your budget uh, until they are they will continue to prepare their package until they submit their package to the committee for approval right so your underwriting is an ongoing process for for the duration of the contract um, so, I mean, we can talk about a lot about this. Uh, there are a lot of steps involved. You know, you, you are talking about environmental, you are talking about the appraisal, you know, lead paint, steady, uh, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, th there is, we, we can talk about these, but in general, it's, it's a lengthy process, right? So once, once the broker has submitted, uh, you know, has done, once the lender has done the, uh, you know, environmental appraisal lead paint study etc broker you know lender submits the you know prepares the package and then they submit that package for committee they get the final um, approval but uh, and here i think i i would defer to what i have written I yeah. okay Leah. i'm gonna put the on mute okay so yeah our so while we were doing all this, the moment we had LOI approved, that's when we start creating the pitch deck for our investors, right? I mean, we don't start the pitch deck for our investors uh, when you have the final approval on the loan. Uh, because, I mean, you are assuming that, uh, you know, we will get the loan because, you know, getting your investors. So property is one thing. Second thing is investors. They, they are they should be worked together um, almost parallelly. So you had your pitch deck, you had to, you know, basically, you know, you were starting to have webinars, soft commitments, you know, you were deciding whether it's going to be five or six B or C, uh, you know, who's going to sign on your loan. Um, so, uh, and all this needs to be reviewed. It takes just so much time, you know, and every time you present uh, information to your investors and it, you know, it gets changed until the final approval of the rate and terms from your, um, you know, from your lender. So there's just too many things. Um, you know, you have to have the boots on the ground, um, collaborate with one or more construction companies uh, who have done similar kind of projects. So all, all this keeps on going on. Um, and at the same time, you are negotiating with everybody. You know, it's like you, you are the master of negotiation art. You have to continue to, um, you have to continue to, uh, you know, invest a lot of time in negotiating with insurance broker for that matter. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, you are you are you are negotiating with your finance broker. You are negotiating with your GCs, property man. You are negotiating with property manager. You are negotiating with the insurance broker. Um, so and lender is giving the insurance um, requirements, um, those are being looked at at the same. So it, it's a team effort. I mean, all, I, all I'm trying to say is that it is, it is a team effort. You are working on your PPM, attorney, subscription agreement. And if you are the new person, uh, you don't have any of the portals like IMS and things like that where things can be easier. You will be spending a lot of time trying to, um, you know, set it up in, uh, you know, DocuSign and PPM is coming, subscription agreement is coming, who is doing the soft commitment, um, you know, and all that. And it's better you start collecting the money sooner uh, than nearing near the closing date. So, so uh, if you can, if your investors are ready, you know, do, I mean, let's, this goes on, you know, basically. So, it's better that you collect money from investors in escrow much before 
the closing date because invariably what will happen is um, you know you will have one or two investors who will be holding the deal you know and you will be you know and and, and you will be basically low balled invariably if you are if you are in deep soup better if you have you know very limited bandwidth better try to get the money sooner from investors otherwise typically you know investors i mean depends on on how how much is your investor base but if you are waiting till towards the end to collect the money uh, you know chances are you will be in trouble so better uh, you know better so these these all these things they go hand in hand basically they go parallel parallel so i think uh, that's all i have for um, again, okay. I, I want to do, so. I just uh, basically, you know, um, just some you know general guidelines. Uh, everybody has different uh, guidelines on their syndication. You know, uh, basically, some if you have three million raise, in general, people allocate thirty percent of GP for for the raise. Right? It means out of three million. Somebody is raising 10%. I mean, again, it's, this cannot be done. The way it is written, it is not a compensation based on the amount. It is something that has to be, equity partner has to be, equity partner is going to get that irrespective of the amount they raise. That's how it, it should be done. If you try to do it based on the amount somebody is raising it and you give it, that is against the SEC rules. SEC, SEC has been tightening up. I mean, you have heard from many syndication syndicator syndication attorneys that if you try to do that, that is against against the law. So yeah, investor, you know, basically somebody is those who are raising money, they are not called, they're not being called nowadays as money raisers. They are called, they are being called as um, equity partners. Right. I mean, what is against the law? Somebody is asking what is against the law. Uh, you, so the person who is raising the money and if you are giving them percentage of GP based on the amount that they are raising, it means they are they are behaving as a that as a equity broker without a license. It is equity brokers job to raise and uh, get the commission on the amount of raise. Any individual, if he is raising the money and getting compensated based on the amount he is raising, uh, uh, is actually uh, not is is being looked at a malpractice by SEC that uh, we are trying to pay the commission without a broker license. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I think somebody somebody is saying that they cannot hear. Yes, you can share it by email. That's not a problem. So yeah, so so what is loan? What is non recourse loan? Okay, so non recourse loan is a loan which is secured by the asset, right? I mean, it is it is not up to the it is not up it in case of in case property is not making if in case we are not able to make the mortgage payment non recourse means uh, the bank is not coming after the syndicator or the sponsors as long as bank cannot establish a bad boy clause they i mean non recourse means uh, you know you are your personal assets are at stake if you are not able to pay the mortgage, bank will take over the property and then sell it. And if there is a difference, then bank will come after you. But in non-recourse, that's not the case, provided that bank is not able to uh, prove that prove uh, gross negligence. It means that you have done what a sponsor has done, what they could have done um, to run the property smoothly. But they are still not able. They still not able to produce enough cash flow. Um, in that case, bank will take over the property, and then they will 
uh, try to put new management or um, or try to sell it but your your personal assets are not at stake that is what but there's a, as i said there's a bad boy clause out also if bank can establish that it was a matter of gross negligence then that non recourse can trigger uh, the recourse also i'm not seeing that happening because of my limited experience um, i'm pretty sure folks have seen it and they talk about it so you know better better be careful on that so yeah many times you know again it depends on the deal you know we can offer to anywhere from five percent to ten percent or sometimes people do offer twenty percent uh, of gp for signing on the loan um, i'm not seeing twenty percent anywhere but uh, you know in general and you know analysis and the legal you know somebody who's who has brought the deal to the table and who has done all the work putting putting together all the package you may get five to ten percent but that these are just uh, general guidelines, you know, it's not hard and fast. Everybody does their business uh, separate, you know, in different ways. Um, asset management can be, you know, 30% of the whole GP and then, you know, earnest money deposit, you know, at, at risk money, you know, the duration four or five months, you know, if you are talking about $10 million property, you are talking about good, um, good, uh, um, you know, two three hundred thousand people may end up asking for ten percent uh, of GP for putting that ten percent at risk money. So we are running a little short of the time, as I said. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, so, so what are the so somebody is asking? So here here is the ebook that I have written: Impact of Recession on Real Estate in United States. Feel free to download this book. Uh, you know. HTTPS, I will copy it, or somebody can type it in the chat. Maybe I can type it in the chat. Uh, give me one second. HTTPS colon bit dot ly slash two z d. Oh, somebody typed it already. Okay. W x u l. Okay. Yeah. Feel free to download this book. Um, you know, just a little bit of stuff in it. Uh, hopefully, you'll find it valuable. Um, um, let's see what else do we have. We have we have a couple questions that came up in the chat. I don't know if we got sure. Them. Sure, let's yeah, let's take care. Yeah, let's take care yeah. of them. Can you ask? Can you look for them? So we me? have one question. Um, going back to the section around the, the LOIs and doing your underwriting. Um, just wanted some clarification around that point as far as uh, doing your underwriting and getting a T12 rent roll, et cetera, prior to um, sending out an LOI and in, in what situations might Yeah, so, so, so I, have seen, I have seen certain sellers who do not want to give a lot of financials about the property beforehand. I've seen that kind of situation happening many times. And but if, if the property is coming to us via broker, then most likely we'll have offering memorandum, T12 and rent roll, and we should have done our underwriting before we submit the LOI, right? I mean, that is something that we should do even before we submit the LOI. Um, if we did not have enough financials, LOI is a, is a non-binding agreement in which you are expressing your interest uh, at around certain price, um, you know, that kind of gives some sentiment from the seller that seller is willing to sell approximately at this price. Uh, if you did not have all the necessary documents, you would do, you probably cannot do underwriting properly, but you will submit an LOI. Once the LOI gets submitted, you'll get these documents and then you will uh, basically uh, uh, get all those documents you will do the underwriting basically but most likely i mean those documents are available and it's better that you do your underwriting before submitting the loi so does that clarify right. okay yep um so someone asked about the um the process of sending out mailers to get those off-market properties do you have examples of the postcards that you send out and, and what you typically put on there Yes, yes, definitely. I will, uh, what I will do is when I send the recording out, 
uh, I have some examples. Um, I can uh, I can probably try to attach one example uh, in that. And I've used I've used certain companies. Yellow Letter Complete is is a good company which I have used in past, and they have those postcards. Actually, they already have that uh, um, format, um, so you really don't need a format from me. But Yellow Letter Complete plus that there are many many other. But I can mention that in the email. Um, you know what are the other companies which I have used in past? I've used certain companies. There, there are very few companies who do calling for multifamily, but even a single family um, calling company can can be useful for for us. So uh, I can mention those names uh, in the email. Any any more questions? Okay. Yeah, and is there any um, specific resource you use to find out if a property is free and clear? Yeah, so basically if you go to, uh, when, you, when you look for the data source, right? If you are looking for listserv or you're looking for Rionami, uh, you would look for, um, I mean, they are, it, it will tell you that there's no mortgage, right? If there's no mortgage on the property, it means it is free and clear. So it is possible that you can, you can, down, you can buy that data directly from these uh, sources for free and clear property. Free and clear um, is a very good question. I did not touch on it. Uh, if you are looking, if you, if, if you find an owner who is willing to sell and his property is free and clear, there's a very good chance that you can get an owner financing because your pitch there is Mr. Seller, if you take a, if, if, if I buy it from you, I pay you cash on this, you're gonna be hit by a big, tax bill would you like to do the owner financing and and kind of uh, drag um, that uh, income for over a couple of years five to ten years it will save you a lot of money on on taxes if you find free and clear properties um, you know that that's the best thing and and if the owner is willing to retire you have hit the jackpot you know don't leave those owners you know, for you know, even if it takes a year for you to buy the property, you know, just remain in touch with those owners. You know, that's that's my personal recommendation. All right, any anything else, okay. GK? Um, I got a couple more questions. I know, sure. um, I know we have over I have, time. I have, time. I have another um, about We're 10 still good. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm trying to trying to select questions that are yeah. best for yeah. everyone. Um, do, 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 do. We already went over loan options. If you can't get rec non-recourse, did we already go over that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, and this property ownership is fee simple. Did we do that? Property ownership is fee simple. Uh, no, I've not done it. And actually I'm not able to recall Okay. What fee simple is? I have not done anything. I mean, fee simple and all—they are typically very popular in single families. Oh, I've not seen many, and maybe I'm wrong. You know, I don't want to give the wrong answer. What do, What does it mean when the property ownership? No, it is free. And, I mean, is it if fee simple is equivalent to free and clear? It means that there is no mortgage on the property. I I do not know what fee simple is. Okay. Um, so we we do have um, another question. This one is more as opinionated about markets and kind of going back to the questions about cap rates. Okay. Um, so this individual is looking at several cities to invest in Chicago, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Florida, and Massachusetts. Um, okay. So do you have any sort of insights or, or any advice that you might be able to give them? See, see basically, if, see, um, I know the, the way the market is right now, uh, and we were not talking about it because we are, we are very close to a long-term recession and we don't know where would it be. Um, um, what we, what at least we are doing is we are holding any decisions to buy 
right now, but we are looking at the uh, areas where the property values have not gone too high, right? I mean, there are a lot of markets like, I mean, I would say uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma or Indianapolis, uh, where prices have not gone to the level where, you know, like cities like Atlanta or, or Orlando, um, so if you are pressed to buy something, you buy in an area where the prices have been more stable and they do not get impacted by recession too much. So you have to kind of compare last eight to 10 years worth of historical data uh, uh, in terms of the property prices, uh, medium income. Um, but I mean, right today, if I have to buy a property, I would be very cautious, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure people are doing a lot of deals, um, but I mean, with, with my discussions with a lot of brokers, you know, they say there are a lot of, lot of sellers, a lot of buyers who are putting, who are dealing their decision to buy something. So, um, so Connecticut, Cincinnati, I mean, Cincinnati is a good market, don't take me wrong, but it has, it has gone up so high. You know, Columbus, Ohio has gone so, gone up so high. Unless I buy something at 75 cents on a dollar today, I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to buy anything, you know, because you have, we have seen the research from Green Street Advisor and, and there are many, many research out there, you know, you, you type it, um, that the, you know, there is a slump, you know, prices are starting to come down. I mean, um, I wouldn't buy even at 95, 90% uh, uh, valuation, you know, so, um, that's just my, my opinion. I mean, I'm not forcing my opinion. Um, uh, so she yes. asked, all right, very good. Somebody, somebody says that they is buying in Florida, you know, if they want to partner, you know, feel free to connect with them. So yeah, Axiometric is another, yeah, Axiometric is another company, basically like CoStar, right? You know, you have Yardy Metrics, which is a property management company axiometrics and co-star are sort of competitor to each other. Um, somebody asked a question. I'm looking at also some of these questions. Um, so yes, somebody is asking is, I heard that mortgages are harder to get now. Is that true? Yes, it is very true. It is very, very true that uh, lenders have tightened their screws and we had a we had somebody on our call uh, last week and and bro and lenders requirements are 12 to 18 freddie and fanny's requirements are uh, 12 to 18 months of uh, principal and interest payments in reserve right i mean that kind of throws the whole deal into the bucket uh, because i mean you are talking about 15 months worth of i mean 18 months worth of payments into um, into the reserve uh, for lender so as of right now, they are pretty, pretty strict. Would they open up as, as the economy opens up? Yes, it will. So oh, would you buy today? I, I probably wouldn't, but uh, if you, if the deal makes sense, if the number makes sense, uh, then, you know, it would, it would should. basically then, yeah, you go for it. But yes, today lenders are very strict, yes. So yeah, somebody, um, what is that? Um, any more questions? Um, I, I think we are good. There's a, there's a couple more, um, I would say better offline, more okay. unique specific um, to the individual. Um, okay. um, so I think unless there's more questions, we could call it, we're, we're a bit over our time anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, you know, my name is Prashant Kumar, and I mean, I like to share information. And and Chike, again, thank you so much for uh, letting me speak today. Uh, but there, if there are any questions, you know, feel free to feel free to call. I mean, feel free to um, send me an email or text. Uh, I would love to have a chat with you. Um, and when you download my ebook, there is an option. Um, you can schedule a call with me. Um, if you want to join our Facebook group, uh, there's an option there too. Um, but if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Just, you know, download the ebook uh, and, and, and give me some feedback. You know, how, how did you like uh, what I wrote in the ebook? But other than that, 
Uh, once again, guys, thank you so much. I still see about 40, 45 people on the 43 people on the call. Really appreciate everybody's time. I hope we were able to provide some value um, to somebody. I mean, there are a bunch of senior syndic syndicators. We are nobody in front of them, but still trying to provide some value to everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, good night, guys. Stop recording.